This is an interview with Joseph Mendez, New York State Military Museum, Saratoga Springs, New York, May 28th, 2003, approximately 11 a.m. Interviewers are Mike Russert and Wayne Clark. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Joseph Mendez, 517-26, Brooklyn, New York. Okay. <clears throat> What was your educational background prior to entering service? Um, vocational high school, mm -hmm. aviation. You completed? Completed. Okay. Um, do you recall where you were and your reaction when you heard about Pearl Harbor? I was a little young at the time. Yes. So, um, it, we were, I was in school, naturally, mm -hmm. and uh, it was sad, but... It, uh, it got worse as it progressed with the newspapers and stuff. Uh -huh, uh -huh. But uh, I was a school, school kid. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And uh, it affected us, but not to the point where we stopped everything else. Uh -huh, uh -huh. It's just that uh, <coughs> later on, the older we got, the closer it got to the point where we were of age. Uh -huh. Um, okay. It started to interest us a little bit more. All right. Were you uh, drafted or did you enlist? Drafted. Okay. Um, where did you? Where was your induction center? Um, I went to uh, Fort Dick, I think. Um, we went up to New York first to uh, go through the procedure and. Um, that was a little bit hairy, but... Uh, In what way? Well, they had um, different levels of, of uh, uh, offices where you had to go through the lines. Mm -hmm. And at that time, uh, they needed men. And uh, they took just about everybody. And uh, they only needed, uh, as I found out at the end, uh, infantry people. Everything else was full up. Uh -huh. um, they, uh, I had at that time um, some uh, information from my doctor about um, my health. I had uh, bad kidneys um, and a bad back and uh, I had some paperwork and when I went to the induction center itself, they went through the line and you got up to a certain point, then they asked you if you had any disabilities or, uh -huh. you know, whatever, that they couldn't see. I handed them the paper and they sent me upstairs. Well, upstairs was a layout with beds and uh, where the doctors were supposed to come and see you. And collaborate what was what was wrong with you. While I was there, I met some of the other guys who were there and I asked them, you know, how long is it gonna be before we get looked at? One guy says, uh, well, I've been here a week and I haven't seen a doctor yet. The other guy says, I've been here two weeks. He says, I have no place to go, so I couldn't care less. And uh, that scared me a little bit because I wasn't going to hang around. So I took my papers and folded them up, went back down in the line and looked around to see where I was going to go next. And they looked at my papers and said, oh, yeah, you go in that line over there. So <laughs> I went through without sh showing anybody my papers. <laughs> I was afraid that. They weren't going to take me, mm -hmm. so they took me <laughs> and went down to the end of the line and where the officer was to put us in. What he asked, what, where would you like to go? What, what service would you like to go? And at that time, everybody in my age was for the Marines. Mm -hmm. So naturally, I said the Marines, and he says, good outfit picks up a stamp and whacks it on my paper, and it was infantry. 
So I said, wait, I says, you, you got the wrong thing. He said, well, that's all we have today. <laughs> so that was, that was it. Where did you go for your basic training? Um, Little Rock, Arkansas. How old were you when you... 18. 18. Had you ever been away from home? No. How, what was that like to... Well, it, it, it was an adventure. I enjoyed it. I, mm -hmm. I thought it was great. And uh, everything was done for you, so I had no problem. And uh, we just... I was in the same boat as everybody else. Mm -hmm. So, And I enjoyed... I enjoyed the... Uh, the camp itself, the activities, and the whole bit. Uh, it seems that we were the last group of uh, inductees that uh, went through the f uh, full basic training. After that, they cut it back to 13 weeks. Mm -hmm. And uh, because I think they, they needed people. They needed uh, uh, people over there to to fill in the spots. And we finished that. We got, I think it was a week, two weeks at home and uh, reported back to the ship we were supposed to get to. Well, actually went to the, the bus and they picked us up at, uh, I forget where that was, in, uh, someplace on, uh, in Brooklyn where we met the bus. And they took us to get the train and shipped us out. Mm -hmm. um, where did you, how did you go to Europe? We went on troop ships. Mm -hmm. And uh, the troop ships, uh, they were small. And this particular one had an overabundance of men and no place to sleep. We were stacked up about six high, and you only had about so much to fit in when you're laying down. So, um, and it was down in the hole, mm -hmm. and there was so many people in it that it was sweaty and hot. So, I think it lasted there uh, half the day, and I took my stuff and went up on deck mm -hmm. and we were allowed to put our uh, blankets and stuff next to the chim the, the smokestacks and we slept around the smokestacks half of us did. Mm -hmm. and uh, it, was, it was a lot better were you in a convoy uh, yeah we were in a convoy it took us two weeks which should take only half the amount of time because it was zigzagging, I guess. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was, I always, I was up on the deck all day and all night. So we'd sleep up there and everything else. And every once in a while we'd get wet, but that wasn't any problem. We'd go down to uh, eat and we'd rush down, eat, and come back up before you have to toss. <laughs> so that wasn't too good. But Did you get seasick? I was squeamish, but I never got sick. I never stayed down long enough to get sick. Mm -hmm. I was always up, up on top. The rougher it was, the, the better it was. For me, anyway. Where did you arrive in Europe? In La Havre, you France. You went into France? Uh, what, what was the date, approximately, do you recall? Well, according to my papers, it was the 17th of January. Mm -hmm. That's what they said we mm -hmm. got there. Now, were you supplied with winter equipment when you arrived? Did you have winter equipment? Oh, yeah. Equipment? Whatever we carried, we threw it in the pile. Mm -hmm. Because everything we were taking over was not for us. It was for replenishing the stock. And uh, everybody carried an extra heavy duffel bag full of clothes and stuff. Mm -hmm. And we went to a uh, uh, the separation place where, where we got our clothes and whatever we needed. From there we got on uh, uh, trucks and got shipped out.
immediately. We didn't we didn't stay anywhere in any time. We just got shipped right out. Mm -hmm. Did you go as a replacement or with a unit? Replacement. Replacement. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. They needed uh, they had use of a lot of replacements. They needed mm -hmm. a lot of men from what we understood. When were you eventually assigned to a unit? A couple of days. Mm -hmm. uh, as long as it took us to get from La Harve to where we were supposed to go. Mm -hmm. And uh, we went to uh, um, Baston, and uh, that's where we started from. Okay, what was your assignment, your unit assignment? Get just, time or just get in a hole. Okay. We, we ended up in a foxhole, and it was very cold. And uh, the only thing I remember is being there with somebody, and uh, we were there for hours at a time, and uh, I got uh, frostbite, both legs were frostbitten. I ended up uh, in the hospital, not the hospital, but the area where we uh, were looked at, and uh, they painted my legs up to my knees. In that purple stuff, and uh, gave me a change of socks and shoes, and I went back. They thawed me out a little bit. Um, so you went right into combat? Did you go right into combat? Uh, yeah, that's just about where it was. Mm -hmm. Actually, it was it was near the end of the Bastogne mm -hmm. uh, uh, section, and uh, but still they were leery of uh, whatever was coming back and forth because they kept uh, counterattacking every once, once in a while. So they needed people. And uh, from what I, I can remember, I think uh, there was two guys or three guys in our squad from the original. And uh, most of us were replacements. So I was in with the replacement right off the bat. And they, they were all my age. Mm -hmm. uh, there wasn't too many older, older people there. Um, did you, what, did, what kind of footwear did you have? The regular uh, combat boots mm -hmm. with the strap. Mm -hmm. And did you, you had an overcoat? Yeah, yeah, we all had coats, and uh, it was cold. You didn't have the rubber boots or anything bundled? Not then, not then. Um, we got them later. Um, I think it was almost too late. <laughs> we got them after a while. Um, they came a little bit after. I don't, I really don't. Mm -hmm. Remember too much about that. Mm -hmm. Half of the stuff was blurry anyway. Yeah. We, uh, being the age I was, and the guys that I was with, hardly knew what was coming anyway, because there was, like I said, there was only two or three guys from the original squad, and they didn't hang around with us to begin with, <laughs> because we had other duties to do and uh, other things to. They wanted us to be different places. Actually, we're just filling in. Uh -huh. so. um, how much combat did you see at that time in, in the Ardennes? Well, at that time, it was pushing. Uh -huh. And uh, we did come up across the, some in the woods every once in a while. We'd come into a wooded area, and they'd shell us and we'd get hit and uh, trees, uh, branches and stuff and uh, we'd get caught and he lay there for a while until it goes away a little bit and then mm -hmm. run like hell. So, and we didn't run back because that's what they were shooting <laughs> most of the time. Every once in a while the shells would hit the trees above us and we'd catch hell. And then uh, going across the fields, the hedgerows were, the, 
dangerous part because mm -hmm. uh, the hedgerows were actually squares of, of uh, farmland and uh, they hid around everything. And going into towns wasn't too bad. Uh, most of the time they were moving away from us and we'd go into a few houses and they'd be going out the other end and uh, running, same as we would be doing, to get away. Did you all, were you always supplied with food? Did you think you had plenty of food at this time? Or no. It, it sometimes took two, three days or more for the kitchens to catch up because we were moving constantly and, and uh, uh, we'd move from one area to another sideways sometimes and then go forward and then go back up to another town and go into the town and uh, uh, wherever it was was needed men that's what we were, we were doing mm -hmm. we were considered a bastard outfit and uh, just to fill spots and holes and if any breakthroughs came through we'd be rushed up to where we were needed uh, it uh, It was, we ate mostly off of the land. We always come to a farmhouse, and most of the times there was chickens, and uh, uh, we'd have eggs, and we'd get along with that. Eggs, chickens, and uh, once in a while we'd come into a, a, a house where they did um, canning, and they'd can in, the, in glass jars, and uh, we could get whatever food there until the kitchen caught up with us. We'd have K rations and mm -hmm. that, you know, they, they were useless as far as we were concerned. We only kept the cans, we threw the rest of it away. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, cigarettes, the guys used to get the cigarettes. I didn't smoke at the time. So I just had the, whatever chocolates were there or whatever we had in there. We'd strip down the boxes and just carry as little as possible. During this period, were you ever able to keep in contact with home through letters? Yeah. Yeah, we, we were able to write whenever we stopped somewhere that we'd stay maybe uh, half the day or so. We'd write letters and then uh, pass them back and whoever got them just, uh, you know, took them to the post office, I guess. They got home, uh, and most of the letters got home. So that wasn't too bad. Now you ended up in the 35th Division. When were you finally assigned? Uh, I was in 35th, uh, right at the basics. Oh, okay. Yeah, and, and in fact, we took our, our um, basic training in that area. Mm -hmm. Arkansas, Kansas, and whatever. There was three three states, and they made up the 35th mm -hmm. division, and um, so that's what we were allotted for, and that's where we went. So, so you basically, even though you were a replacement, it was in the within the 35th just 35th division. replacement okay. for the 35th. Okay, 137th. Infantry. Mm -hmm. um, so you stayed with that unit throughout? Throughout the war, yeah. War. It's only lasted, for me, lasted from January till, till the end of the war. End of the war. Mm -hmm. uh, now, it said you were a scout. Did you volunteer to be a scout or were you a scout? Yeah, I did. <laughs> I, I found out that uh, uh, being a scout, they let you go by without any problems. And they'd shoot whoever was behind me. <laughs> and uh, that was that was early on. Mm -hmm. I found that out. And uh, I was told by one of the, the older older guys that mentioned the fact that uh, he, he didn't want to do that anymore. 
he was getting skittish. Mm -hmm. In fact, we had we had uh, one of the guys who were in our squad was uh, from the original landing, and he came from the landing on one of the beaches, right straight through. And uh, he was a sergeant, and he never got hurt, never got wounded, and he was getting skittish. And he was <laughs> like this almost all the time, coming close to the end of the war. He figured, <laughs> I don't want to do anything that jeopardize my life. <laughs> so he decided to take it now, easy. Did you have any special training at all, or was it on the job training? No, no, just, they just said, well, go ahead, see who, see what's up there, and see what what is there and, and just so what were your responsibilities as a, as a scout just to look look and see if there was anybody there mm -hmm. and uh, we'd go and sometimes we'd go into the towns and look around and uh, after we looked around a while of course half the time we missed most of it because they were hiding anyway so we'd say there was nobody there We'd look around in the house once in a while, look in windows, and then come back and say, well, don't see any movement, so everybody moved up. Did you work as a team? Yeah, we had, it was three of us, it was uh, um, the three replacements that I hooked up with, was, one was a Mexican, uh, Hernandez, Philemon Hernandez. <laughs> And uh, uh, LeBeau was an Indian from Midwest, and uh, we were just about the same age, so we hung out together. And then regardless of where it was, we went together. And uh, we all did scouts' duties. Did you uh, ever have to call in artillery? Now we never, in fact, I don't remember, I don't remember being with somebody that had the phones. Mm -hmm. um, we were going into a town and uh, nobody with us had phones. So we'd, we'd be one or two squads going in and that, we never, uh, we never had use of the phones, and uh, behind us, they had everything. Uh, they had the heavier stuff, and because uh, we, we, we'd go into a town mainly to get out of the woods, to get out of the woods and go into the town and get some place where we could have cover. Sometimes it was raining. We wanted to get out of the rain. And we go into the first first houses that we come to, and uh, without without looking around first, and uh, didn't make any difference who was there. We'd stay in at least nice, warm, what we considered warm. So the houses were usually occupied by civilians. Uh, no. The civilians were gone. Most of the civilians were gone. Uh, the only ones that were there could have been and were uh, German troops. Uh, they'd see us and hear us, and they'd go someplace else. Because I, I guess they didn't want to do any battling at the time. But most of the time, we'd just get into a town, and after we rested a while, then we started going through. And uh, they would uh, be ahead of us, because we could hear them. They'd be going out one door, we'd be coming in the other. And uh, very seldom did we shoot anybody, because they just kept moving ahead of us. And uh, every once in a while, they'd we come across one or two, or a few more that would give up. They just, and we take prisoners and 
It's in the back. It sounds like they were tired of fighting. It. I would if I was them. They were. They were getting beat. Um, and they were tired. But uh, some of the SS, they didn't give up. The Wehrmacht, the regular army, were the ones that were tired of the whole thing. The SS just kept going back and uh, setting up again. So, What kind of weapon did you carry? Well, we carried uh, the M1. But when we went into the town, we confiscated a few of uh, these carbines, army carbines. Mm -hmm. So we carried them in into the houses. They were easier to maneuver. And uh, with a rifle, it was, it was too long, too heavy. And in case you needed to move it fast, and you could use a carbine with one, one hand, mm -hmm. you could hold on to the carbine and still shoot it. And then that's... That's about all we we did with that. Well, it said uh, here in your forum, you said the thing that left the greatest impression was how much endurance the body could take. What did you mean by that? Well, every time we we went into a, an area, we would either go through a town or we'd go through the woods, and we'd be walking for quite a bit, and something would come down the line saying that, well, we're not hitting too much resistance here, and the officer, would, our officers would come and say, well, we're moving. We'd stop, get on the trucks, get shipped who knows where, because <laughs> we didn't know where we were going until we got there, and it, sometimes a few hours of riding on the truck. We'd get out, and usually it was dark, and we'd start walking. And we'd walk for six, eight, ten hours sometimes, almost completely in the dark. And uh, when we got to where we were going, we'd have to go into the town without any rest. That's riding on the truck doesn't give you much time to sleep. And walking all night didn't give us much time to sleep either. So when we got to the towns that we were supposed to go to to help keep it, we were dead tired. But as soon as shells start coming, we ran. And I mean top speed, top speed. And we could do it because we were young, very young. Now, during one of these periods, is this when you said the funniest incident you recall happens? Something about a friend sleepwalking? Yeah, during the night, you could see the guys weaving back and forth, and you'd go over and you'd shake them a little bit, and they'd wake up. They probably didn't have their eyes closed, but they must have been asleep because they would weave, you know, mm -hmm. like as if they were. <laughs> And they, that was, that was tiring, it was very tiring. But uh, we didn't carry too much anyway. We carried just the ammo we had and uh, no packs. We got rid of them right away. Uh, the water, canteen. Uh, we really didn't carry any mess kits because there was nothing to eat except for the thing. Whatever we needed, uh, a mess kit, we used our cup, a canteen cup, and uh, we cooked in it and the whole bit. Did anybody carry a BAR or a machine gun? Yeah, they had. We had BARs with us. Uh, I didn't carry one. I was too small, and uh, they were heavy. Mm -hmm. The biggest, the biggest in our group, uh, carried that. And we sometimes carried uh, some mortar ammunition in case we were expected to use the mortar for anything. And but that's about it. Mm -hmm. We all had bandoliers of uh, ammo. And that's all we carried.
Um, so you you did this right up until the end of the war? Until we got to the to the uh, El Briva. Mm -hmm. uh, we came. Well, we we kept going back and forth, up and down. We we were attached to the Ninth Army at one time uh, for a little while. Then they moved us over to the British, and we fought with the British for a while. And then we came back down to Metz and uh, started going towards the Elbe River. And we, when we reached the Elbe River, we were told to stop. Mm -hmm. And at that point, they says, we're going to stay here. And we stayed at the Elbe River for about a week, waiting for the Russians. Did you ever encounter the Russians? Uh, yeah, we they came eventually. Uh, we were on we were on both sides of the Elbe River. In fact, we took pictures on the Elbe on the opposite side, the Berlin side of uh -huh. the Elbe River, while we were waiting. And uh, they <laughs> they told us don't accept any prisoners. If they start coming across the Elbe, push them back. Tell them to go back. Well, we couldn't do that. <laughs> there was too many coming over. And we couldn't shoot them. So we we let them come, and they they came in droves. So they didn't want to surrender to the Russians? Never. Mm -hmm. Never. In fact, that's what they said. They said, uh, we'd rather surrender to you. And they were deathly afraid mm -hmm. of the Russian troops coming through. And uh, I guess they heard horror stories, which are, I don't know, I would be afraid myself. <laughs> they, now, you actually met some of the Russian soldiers? Oh, yeah. What was did. your impression of them? They were good. They were like us. They were, uh, they were uh, just as tired as we were. Were they friendly? To yes. You? Oh, yeah. Very friendly. In fact, uh, too friendly. <laughs> we got drunk a couple of times. <laughs> a little too friendly. <laughs> Did you uh, ever encounter any of the concentration camps? On our way back, we were um, in charge of a concentration group uh, area. And uh, the, I forget where the heck it was, though. I don't, I don't remember where it was. But we had, uh, we had to stand guard on the prisoners. The concentration camp, we had, they, they said, we called them prisoners, but they weren't prisoners. They were mm -hmm. people in the concentration camp. And uh, every day they'd go out. And they'd get um, potatoes, anything to make corn liquor. They made vodka, and they always made vodka. The prisoners did. Yes. Who were the prisoners in the camp? Um, a mixture, a mixture of everything. Uh, Polish, uh, all kinds, and we had no idea who they were because uh, we couldn't speak the language, so mm -hmm. it didn't. They just were happy to see us, and uh, they gave us uh, some of their mash, <laughs> uh, and we got a couple of times we got really soused on their corn liquor, <laughs> so, their so vodka. This, was, this wasn't an extermination camp, was it? Not that we saw. No, uh -huh. no. It was just they were they were starved, mm -hmm. but. Uh, it wasn't one of the big uh, termination camps. Mm -hmm. No, I never encountered one of those. This was bad enough. Mm -hmm. uh, they were, and we, we let them go into town and we made sure that they didn't destroy anything. And when they came back, they were, they were good, but uh, Standing guard over those kind of people were was ridiculous, but 
we had to do it so that they wouldn't all go to town and, uh -huh. you know, rummage through and make a mess or destroy anything, so. Uh. Um, do you recall what your reaction was and where you were when you heard about the death of President Roosevelt? That was a sad day because uh, it was two days before my birthday. He died on the 15th when we heard. I think it was the 15th when he died. And that was, uh, I was 19, going, on, going to be 19. Mm -hmm. And uh, everybody was sad. They didn't know what was going to happen next. Uh, but no, no big problem. It's just that we were sad that he died. Mm -hmm. And uh, we kept moving back. Um, we'd stay, we'd set up a uh, military government in the different towns as we went back. And every town we'd hit, we'd set up a military government and then move to the next town. And then the headquarters came up and they would take over the town. And then we'd move to another town and set up another. And we progressively went back towards the French coast. For some reason, we were going back to uh, get on a ship to go to Japan. And we got back, I'd say, almost two-thirds of the way back across Europe. And uh, the end of the war came in uh, Japan. How did you feel when you heard about the atomic bombs dropping in the I had, we didn't feel anything about that. Um, all, we, all we knew was that the end of the war mm -hmm. had come. And uh, we were happy because we didn't have to go to Japan. Because that's where we were going. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what, what we were told. We were moving back to go there, and because uh, from what happened, if they didn't drop it, we would have been there, and I didn't, I didn't like the idea mm -hmm. myself. <laughs> when were you discharged? Um, June thirtieth, forty-five. I had in, uh, I had. One year, 10 months, and 30 days. I got out a month earlier than two years. Um, at that time, they had the, uh, the point system. And you got so many points for you know, battle stars, so many points for being overseas, so many points for whatever. And uh, the... the uh, points for getting out at that time was 25 points and I had that so I they just sent me back they sent me back to the hospital first to uh, check out uh, all my stories <laughs> about my health um, while I was in basic um, I had bad kidneys, and uh, not bad. It was it was uh, I had to go a lot, mm -hmm. and regardless of where it was, I had to go. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, uh, when I told the sergeant uh, that you know I needed had a problem. Uh, he said, well, how come you got in here anyway? How come they let you in? I said, well, I told him the story. <laughs> and he said, okay, if you have to go at any time, you just take off. Mm -hmm. And I got through basic more or less that way. Whenever we had a parade, 
I'd switch with whoever was on KP, and they do the parade, and I do the KP. When you are we're in a parade, the weekends, right after the parade was free time, so they would more than willing to mm -hmm. work, work work the parade, and I did the KP, and uh, I got through with that. And when went overseas, it was the same thing. Um, I'd be the one that uh, would have to stop and and relieve myself. That just, it just it was a continuous operation like that. Um, when I came back, they sent me to the hospital because they had marked down on my papers that this was was the case, and uh, I um, went to. Uh, Camp Campbell. I was in the hospital for a few weeks. They made tests. They did all kinds of stuff. Couldn't find anything. Um, they checked my back. They did x-rays and didn't find anything because the only time they could see anything would be if my back went out. Then they would see the displacement, but they couldn't find anything. So uh, then they sent me to Fort Knox, from one hospital to F Fort Knox, um, the hospital there. And then I went to Camp Camp Campbell, Kentucky, uh, Camp White Tie, and I stayed there as a um, switchboard operator. They needed somebody there, and they. Just to hold, and the holding, holding time, because uh -huh. I did nothing else. I was just waiting to get out until they got around to let me go. <laughs> and then that's that was it. They they let me go. Did you ever have any tro trouble, or have you had any problems with your frostbite areas at all? Or I got flat feet out of it because uh -huh. yeah. they went completely flat uh -huh. right out there. Went out of that, and, then, and with all the walking and the traipsing around, um, they were they were dead flat. Mm -hmm. And uh, I uh, got a compensation out of it, and uh, I got fitted for uh, arches, and uh, they were good. They were all right. Every once in a while, they'd call me in and uh, for another examination. They'd look at it and they said, I don't know why we're looking at you. They're flat. <laughs> There's nothing we can do for <laughs> you. Unless you have an operation. I said, well, how long will that last? And they said, well, it lasts for a while and then sometimes it goes flat again and there's nothing we can do. I said, no, I don't want an operation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they, I think they, they called me back four or five different times. A span of a few years at a time, and uh, the last time they says we're signing you off. That's that's ridiculous, we're wasting our time. Mm -hmm. So they decided not to call me back again. Did you uh, make use of the GI Bill at all after? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Uh, when I come back, uh, about a year after I came back, uh, I got married, and. Uh, uh, I had a job, and we had a we had a baby, and um, I wanted to go back to school. And in the process, I had lost my job, and I said, "Well, uh, the one way of getting some money steady was to go to school on the GI Bill." Mm -hmm. So I went to GI Bill and uh, Crescent School of Radio and TV, and I was there for. Until I found a good job, <laughs> and then <laughs> the uh, job that I found was through the uh, that it, for the reason that I went to school in a TV place manufacturer, mm -hmm. and uh, that was a nice job. And then after that, I just kept moving along, going from one job to another, and uh, it 
was it was good use of the of the GI Bill. Mm -hmm. Did you ever use their fifty two twenty club? Fifty two dollars or uh, twenty dollars uh, for fifty two weeks. Twenty dollars a week. It's like unemployment. No. Okay. I just used the uh, the uh, schooling money. Did you stay in contact with anyone that you served with? <clears throat> for a while, I kept in contact with Philemon Hernandez. Mm -hmm. uh, Lebeau went his way, and I never did hear from him again. Um, Philemon went regular army, and he was signed back in Texas somewhere. Uh, a couple of letters, and then lost track of him. And uh, that's... Mm -hmm. Do you ever uh, have any reunions, go to any reunions or anything? No, they, they, the, it was in Arkansas. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have two nickels to rub together. So the reunions were out of reach. <laughs> I couldn't make it. Mm -hmm. So, I, and I had a family, and uh, it was just too far out of my reach. Mm -hmm. So I never made uh, it. Did you join any veterans organizations? Every one that was available. And still I still belong to every one of them. Mm -hmm. um, VFW, American Legion, DAV, and uh, I guess that's the ones that are mm -hmm. available now, and I belong to the uh, ITAM in uh, Saratoga on uh, Grand Avenue. Mm -hmm. What is that? Um, Italian American War Veterans. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> I was Italian. <laughs> I'm half Italian. <laughs> and then I. Sorry. That's okay. I, uh, I was commander from 83 to 85 in the ITAM. You, you take these covers off? No, that's okay. what I'm looking to see. And then uh, 86 to 87, I was uh, state commander in the ITAM. So, and that when I was state commander, my daughter was post commander oh. at the same time in the ITAM. She was uh, she was in the wax, so uh, it was very 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 nice. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do you think uh, your service, your time in service, changed or affected your life? Do you think it did in any way? Not really. Mm -hmm. um, I was only in there for not even two years, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, I, I imagine that I would have come home and, or I, if I stayed home, I would have found jobs anyway, and I, I may not have gone through the same occupations that I did. Because I went in for aviation mm -hmm. in uh, high school, in the vocational school. And when I came out and went to the GI Bill, I went into electronics. And uh, that's what I did most of my life. Uh, worked in Con Ed uh, in New York. And uh, from there I went up to uh, Schenectady to uh, GE. and. Uh, most of my time was in GE. Uh, spent 34 years in GE, and um, ended up in West Milton. Mm -hmm. uh, we uh, we built the uh, MARF program up at West Milton. I was in the construction, uh, following the, con the construction of the uh, the MARF program. Now, did you have some photographs in that book? I think you donated a lot. I, I donated all oh, of the, all of the photographs. Mm -hmm. okay. But this this is the the Santa Fe, which is what they were called, and the uh, 35th Division book. I bought this just to find out where I had been. 
because up up to this point, all I did was remember a few names, mm -hmm. and I had no idea what we did, where we were, and I'm in the last part of the book. <laughs> when they were finished with Bastogne uh, in Belgium, they, that's where I got in, mm -hmm. and then reading about where we went, we did go up and down quite a number of times mm -hmm. and a number of a number of different places and 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 uh, the regiment 137th was mentioned in here uh, in a number of different places mm -hmm. and actually what we what we did during that time and half the stuff I didn't remember mm -hmm. because it, part of it was a blur and then the accommodations we got from the generals and the, and the uh, things, all the all the all the accommodations that the uh, were were given to us mm -hmm. uh, it was in this book. So it did it did help. Uh, okay. Let me know where I was, mm -hmm. where I had been, <laughs> more or less. All right. Well, thank you very much for your interview. Yes. Thank you.